there's certain things that are out there that they have all agreed within that So I think the amount of second reading was from a research point of view, it's easier when I can look and say, these were the religious about the 95 thing, or the council to be or whatever it tends to be in a given day. And say, here's how they're boundaries because my six year old understands that my team on the what are they I'm good, right? Uh, uh, where does uh, the uh, right. uh, right. No, no, no. no. Right. Okay, uh, let's get started. Um, welcome to the Annenberg Research Colloquium. Um, today we are very pleased to have David, David Hesmendolch. I've been practicing the name. Um, um, uh, as our guest speaker, he comes to us from the University of Leeds. Actually, he comes to us from the University of Washington. He was in Seattle last weekend for a conference and will be at UCLA later this week. So he's kind of making it. Pacific Western tour, um, uh, and he is, but he is visiting us from the University of Leeds, where he's a professor of uh, media and music industries, and the director of the Media Industries Research Center. He is the author of a very well-known book, The Culture in Cultural Industries, which is now just out in its second edition, um, as well as um, a book, Media Production, Western Music and its Others, and his latest book, with Jason Coinbee, The Media and Social Theory. Um, <clears throat> David's work analyzes tradition, uh, transitions and continuities in media industries such as TV, film, music, and publishing, which I think we'll be talking about today, um, as well as the current impact of new media on contemporary cultural industries. His interests in the media cover a broad range um, from production and consumption within the music industry to the politics of power within the creation of music to the intersections between policy, theory, and the political economy. So um, his work has been very important to scholars who um, are working in media and cultural studies, especially those of us who are interested in looking at intersections and relations between production, consumption, industry, policy, the political economy, cultural desire. So his talk today is titled Theorizing and Researching Creative Labor, um, and um, I, he'll be uh, talking to us about media and creative labor and the ways in which this kind of labor is different if it is different from other kinds. So please welcome Professor Hesmanbach. Thanks very much, Sarah. I just wanted to start by saying uh, thank you to Peter and Janelle and uh, various other people who made it possible for me to come here. And as I live in the north of England, I haven't seen sunshine for eight months. <laughs> if I keel over with heat exhaustion, do forgive me. Okay, I'm just going to start by outlining what I want to do. Uh, I want to introduce some recent issues and development and study of the work that goes in to the media products that we consume, study, interpret. And then I want to report briefly on a study that I conducted with a colleague in the UK in 2006-2007 on that subject. In five parts. First of all, I want to explain why I think it's important that we study creative labour and in the process explain to you what I mean by that term. Then I'll look with brutal brevity at a number of approaches that have been taken to the study of work and production. Then I turn to that project, the Creative Work in the Cultural Industries project. And I'll go through four main empirical elements, um, at least in terms of how we've organised it in the study before going on to some brief concluding comments. This is all pretty fresh. This is the first time I've talked about the project in, in this way. I've kind of dealt with various aspects of it in other talks, so bear with me. First of all, that issue, why study creative labor? 
in the modern world, it's more and more considered to be a desirable characteristic of work that it involves a creative component. More or less any kind of work can be creative. But in terms of the way people discuss jobs and employment, there's a particular set of jobs that are often felt to be particularly imbued with creativity. And lots of those jobs are in the arts, media, and to some extent, the new media sectors. I want to put what I'm talking about in the context of policy, at least to begin from policy. What you got from the 1980s onwards, particularly in Europe, was an increasing use of this hallowed term creativity in urban and cultural policy, drawing on an older legacy of humanistic psychology and management studies that have told us that one of the things that makes us distinctively human is this entity, creativity. This cult of creativity in urban and cultural policy helped bring about a shift in terminology. The term that had been used widely in media policy, communications policy in the 70s and 80s in Europe was cultural industries. By the 90s, there was a shift over to the term creative industries on the part of national and regional governments. This new era of creative industries policy involved, obviously, an emphasis on the economic benefits of expanding that sector of the economy. But there was also a new emphasis on the idea that people would be able to achieve some kind of self-realisation through creative labour in the arts, in the media, and so on. But the about aim of creative industries policy is to simply increase the number of creative jobs in the economy and the economic outputs coming out of that. I should say that this isn't just a British thing, even though um, creative industries is a term that's been particularly associated with Tony Blair's Labour government from 1997 onwards. Cre there are literally hundreds of creative industries policies throughout the world, including many now enshrined in the five-year plans of various Chinese cities. So I think that makes it important and interesting to ask, if governments are keen to expand these jobs, to make more of these jobs available, what kinds of jobs are they? Might they really provide, as many policy documents claim, greater satisfaction, pleasure, self-realisation and quality of life than other kinds of work. And how might we understand creative labour in the broader context of contemporary change? So, I'm now, in order to contextualise the approach myself and my colleague Sarah, Sarah Baker have taken in the research we've conducted. I'm just going to whistle through here four approaches that have been taken to work and production. First of all, the Marxists. For all its many problems, the work of Marx provides us with what I think is an essential insight, which is that the privilege of some depends on the work of others, and that that work can involve suffering. <laughs> Our pleasure can be linked to others' pain. The key concept that Marx uses in order to get at the subjective dimensions of that, the experiential dimensions of that, is alienation. Again, highly problematic in the work of Marx, but at least it draws attention to that question of the degree to which labour might promote or inhibit our self-realisation as human beings, both at the individual and the collective level. But strangely, what you get in the Marxist tradition after Marx is a real neglect of work 
of labour until really the 1970s with the rise of what are called labour process studies, notably the work of Harry Braverman, uh, published in 1974, which starts, reignites really a debate within Marxism on the nature of work. But that 70s, 80s generation of Marxian study of labour, of work, was vulnerable to criticism that actually it had no adequate account of subjectivity. That criticism came in particular from the managers, the management studies literature. The critical, which in the case of management studies tends actually to mean post-structuralist management studies literature, was able to offer an analysis of people's affective attachments to organisations, the way in which workers internalise the goals and values of the institutions that they work for. They were also able to offer an analysis of how the post-war crisis of work, as it was called, analysed in endless sociological tracts and, and, and journalistic articles, books by people like Daniel Bell, how that crisis in people's relationship to work led to the development of what we call post-bureaucratic forms of work, encouraging people to feel more involved in their work, gaining more pleasure from it. Now, that post-structuralist management studies literature is helpful in those respects, but from my perspective, as with a great deal of neo-Foucauldian literature, I think questions of normativity and agency are suppressed. Normativity. What really would constitute good work in modern societies? Fulfilling, pleasing work. That question is hidden. Questions of agency. How might we bring about better forms of work? The third category of studies of work and production that I want to discuss. Sociologists. Here a strong focus on transformations. Many writings on the rise of flexible working, knowledge working, information labour. These issues are central to some, some of the major social theorists of our time. Bauman, Beck, Castell, Senna. This um, is aware really for what, one of the reasons we might be interested in creative labour more specifically in the media industries, artistic labour. And this is well put, I think, by Andrew Ross, who's uh, broken important ground in study in this area. Um, as he puts it, the traditional profile of the artist as unattached and adaptable to circumstance is surely now coming into its own as the ideal definition of the knowledge worker. Comfortable in an ever-changing environment that demands creative shifts in communication with different kinds of clients and partners. Attitudinally geared towards production that requires long and often, often unsocial hours. And, a, un, and accustomed to a contingent rather than a fixed routine of self-application. Another angle on this is taken by the French sociologists, Voltansky and Chiapello, in what I think is one of the most significant works of social theory in recent years, The New Spirit of Capitalism, where they talk about the increasing focus on autonomy and creativity in work on the part of management as an appropriation by capital of what they call artistic critique. Just to explain that, in that book, they make a distinction between two principal ways they believe that criticism has been directed at capitalism. One they call social critique, which is criticism of those aspects of capitalism that involve poverty, exploitation, immiseration. But on the other hand, what they call artistic critique which emphasises the critique of capitalism 
as a source of disenchantment and inauthenticity. They're clear that that kind of notion of artistic critique is ambivalent, that it involves problems as well as gains. But they see the incorporation of that critique into these new forms of work that involve so-called self-realisation as a problem, a potential loss. And they raise the question that for me is a politically important one about the fate of autonomy in a new system that enfolds autonomy into capitalism as a goal. But Anyone interested in creative labour on the basis of engagement with these different literatures that I've just outlined, on turning to the very substantial literature that there's been on the media industries, on cultural production, would actually find there a remarkable neglect of those aspects of production that are about labour, about work at least until recently. There are some exceptions in some corners, really, of political economy. But more recently, there's been what a number of people now are referring to as a turn to cultural work, a real rise in studies of creative labour, media work, and so on. But strangely, or interestingly, given its traditional animosity towards questions of production and its general preference for audience analysis and textual analysis, it's been cultural studies that has provided the main intellectual impetus behind this turn to cultural work. In turn, a form of cultural studies that's drawn on the post-structuralist critical management studies literature that I referred to earlier. <coughs> a, a lot of this work is helpful and uh, directly contributes to the kind of work that me and my colleague Sarah and others are doing. But one problem from my perspective is that that cultural studies oriented turn to cultural work ignores what I think is a fundamental aspect of any understanding of creative labour, which is the dialectic of creativity and commerce. That creativity, creativity commerce dialectic, or art commerce as it's sometimes known, is um, investigated, explored by writers such as Bourdieu in The Rules of Art, Raymond Williams in his later sociological work and uh, actually a very um, underrated and neglected study by um, an organisational sociologist called Bill Ryan. Okay, so having now laid out these four areas of studies of work and production that um, are relevant, I want to briefly outline our assumptions in, in, in our research project. An adequate approach to creative labour needs that emphasis on power, exploitation and inequality that's found in the best aspects of the Marxian tradition, but also a focus on institutions and on subjective experience that some of the best management studies literature provides. We need an understanding of the potential and actual tensions between commerce and creative autonomy and to link that to political questions concerning freedom. You know, what degree of freedom can we have as agents in modern society? And just to add one in that I'll come back to in a minute, we need an understanding of the importance of genre. Underlying all this, though, is a, a fundamental question that we sought to investigate. To what extent is it possible to do good work in the cultural industries now. Can I ask a quick question to make sure I understand? Yeah. So you're really interested in creative, creative labor from a top-down perspective. You're not really looking at 
people doing, creating their own creative labor. I mean, you see it all over the place on YouTube and everywhere else, people doing their own creative work um, for their own creative purposes. But you're not, you're not looking at that. Uh, uh, I wouldn't say that it's top down rather than bottom up. I'm interested in both of those dimensions. But I'm interested in professional and semi-professional creative labor okay. rather than having to. So people are paid for. Yeah, yeah. It's how, whether you can make a living out of doing this stuff. Okay, so let me talk about the project. Um, it, it was a funded project, and thank my funders. Um, it involved. Sincerely. <laughs> <laughs> it involves 63 semi-structured interviews with uh, a range uh, of uh, workers and managers. We tried to get a mixture of people who have been in the game a long time, relative newcomers, salaried professionals versus freelancers. We tried to combine various dimensions. Importantly though, we, we tried to balance the... Uh, we try to spread the sample across uh, three industries that, in various ways that I won't go into just now, represent different um, industrial dynamics, music, television, and magazines. I said before that I believe that genre is a very important way in which to understand cultural production. That's drawing on the work of people like Keith Negus and Simon Frith on the music industry. So we chose three genres for each industry. Uh, in music, we were looking at jazz, hip hop, and the meeting place of rock and pop. In television, we were looking at drama, at arts history documentaries, and at what in Britain is called factual or sometimes factual entertainment. Um, it's really where documentary becomes reality TVized. That's the kind of <laughs> new genre term. <laughs> And in magazines, we were looking at music journalism, at men's magazines, and at the thrilling genre of the building and construction of the trade press. <laughs> but people work in the trade press, and it's been extremely understudied as a genre of culture. And we undertook participant observation on uh, a television talent show. Sadly not, Britain's got talent because <laughs> I've arrived in America to discover that there's now a new huge celebrity. This, I don't even know her name because it all happened while I was in the air. Do you know what I mean? This woman, yeah. Susan Boyle. Wow. <laughs> wasn't that show, I'm afraid. And I should say also that we, we look at, like uh, uh, John Thornton Caldwell in his wonderful book of last year, Production Culture. I, I, I should have thanked John at the beginning as well because he was someone who, who put me in contact with you people at Annenberg. Uh, like John, we were also looking at a whole set of documents and artefacts that, if you like, create the culture around production in these, in these worlds, um, from you know, catalogues in trade shows to um, the trade magazines, you know, Music Week or Broadcasting where professionals read about their own um, industry. Right, so I'm now going to work through um, the four main empirical elements of the study. Um, so I've, I've, I've gone for breadth here rather than depth because I, I want to try and um, convey um, the interrelatedness of these different elements. So there's going to be four, this is the first. Um, but, uh, um, and this is, this is part of all these are chapters in the book that Sarah and I are currently writing which exist as articles either already published or under consideration so this first one uh, tackles that issue of autonomy, creativity and commerce um, or attempts to what we do is look at how autonomy is managed in these three different industries. We look at how workers and managers currently conceive of the major threats to that autonomous space that's allowed for them within the cultural industries. A particularly important one in the European context is the erosion 
of the public the way in which public service broadcasting traditionally acted as actually a protection of that independence and autonomy. But another major hold on autonomy now, a growing one, is a kind of obligation to network. As these worlds of cultural production become more and more fragmented, the way in which people maintain coherence is to network both by indirect means, email, Facebook, MySpace and so on, but also through myriads of networking events, all of which involve a kind of a superficial warmth and friendliness that are underpinned <laughs> by a great deal of competition and individualism. And the third category we look at is the strongly perceived increasing role of marketing in the production of cultural goods. The increasing influence of marketers within cultural organisations who, according to the sociological literature that I was discussing earlier, the Bill Ryan, Raymond Williams, Pierre Bourdieu, especially Bill Ryan's book, have a very different set of interests from those more directly involved in creative labour, the musicians, the writers, the directors, the actors, the magazine journalists and so on. We undertook a comparison. I, I, I just want to, if, in each case, I'm just going to go in a little deeper, just uh, for illustration, really. So here I want to refer to one set, section of, of our chapter where we, we compare the different notions of autonomy that are at work in two different genres of magazines. In the music press, in music journalism, you get high levels of operational autonomy. And we came through interviews and, 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 and reading the kind of uh, the kind of ephemeral materials produced by industries. We came to, to see that that operational autonomy is linked to an almost mythical view of the creative autonomy associated with musicians. Something about music that uh, is imbued, supposedly at least, with particularly strong impulses towards creative freedom. And the music press is strangely parasitic on that. Music journalists model themselves on musicians in terms of their opposition to formal bureaucratic structures. So here's one um, um, mu dance music magazine editor talking about um, whether what he does is actually management in that context. He says, well, I mean it's management in the sense that you're trying to get people to do what you want them to do, and you're trying to get the best out of them, but it's enormously informal, and every time I've seen any attempt at formalised relationships, particularly with freelancers, with contracts, with notification of rights and duties and obligations and so forth, it doesn't really work very well. I think it's the kind of business that attracts people who, do, who don't like rules and want very informal relationships. And I think the success of the magazines that we publish and the ideas that go into them is down to those informal relationships. So, all about, you know, people wander in at half past eleven in the morning, hungover, you know, um, with some, you know, dishevelled all being thrown on at the last minute, no problem. No performance indicators, no targets. But against that operational autonomy, you get actually some strong commercial pressures on the rise, especially in certain subgenres of the music press. So here's one um, a freelance journalist. I do know of a lot of instances where I've had to review or interview somebody simply because their label or company has taken out a large amount of ads with such and such magazine. I do know of instances where people have paid for covers and they're paid for features, they're paid for a certain amount of page space over a certain amount of time. Largely unthinkable in the 1960s and 70s in the heyday of creative autonomy in the music rack.
Compare that with the building and trade construction press. Building and construction trade press, I'm sorry. <coughs> Here you have a professional rather than a bohemian notion of autonomy based on the idea of serving a public rather than that notion of artistic freedom. But with a strong commercial reliance on big, well capitalised construction <coughs> companies who were the key advertisers. Here's how it operates in the world of a, um, a, a not a magazine editor, but a, a section editor. She says, we also have a massive programme because it's a commercial operation of supplements which go into specialist sectors, which is where I would say the creativity goes down a little, okay? commerce, creativity, tension. Because these are areas which we put on our publishing calendar because it's easy for the sales team then to talk to advertisers and say, Hey, we've got a... Sorry, I can't read this. Hey, we've got a special coming up on concrete. Why don't you advertise? There's no disrespect to concrete. It's much more important than... <coughs> For that reason, those supplements tend to be big, and we're always under pressure to feature certain companies. I'd say there's a big tension between editorial, you know, the people who are doing the writing, and sales, because they're always trying to push us to write more about their clients and we're trying to do more general issue based stuff and also they don't want us to upset their clients so you see the real constraints and autonomy but it's not as simple as music press relatively autonomous trade press less it's largely dependent on the resources and the reputation of the institution so here's um, a, a, an editor of a different um, uh, building uh, trade magazine I mean, our front page story almost every week will be upsetting someone and they will be threatening to pull advertising. So it's always a very tricky one. But because we're a big paper, this is what I love about the name of the magazine. We can do it. All the papers I've worked for, you just get bullied and you sort of go down. So, Though we're dealing with these kind of organisational questions of how people negotiate the pressures constraining their freedom and autonomy. But now I want to turn to questions of the quality of working life. What kind of lives people lead when they're negotiating these things. What we do here builds on previous research that's taking place more on artistic labour markets, on painters, sculptors, dancers and so on. Which shows that artistic labour is marked by people holding multiple jobs, doing irregular self-employed or freelance work, very dominated by short-term contracts, very little job protection, <coughs> highly uncertain career prospects, very unequal earnings with massive rewards at the top and a huge reservoir of under-rewarded workers and a young workforce. All those are true of the media labour for workforce as well. It also builds on research on new media work. The aforementioned Andrew Ross, Andreas Vittel, Ross Gill, Gina Neff. Here we pick up on the subjective aspect of autonomy that I was introducing at the beginning, including a deep ambivalence. What we found was a deep ambivalence on the part of workers towards their jobs. As one of our interviewees put it, it's freedom, but a very complicated version of freedom. But our aim primarily was to examine attitudes and values of workers in relation to some key areas. Pay, working hours and conditions, including questions of union protection. The insecurity and uncertainty that was prevalent in um, these industries on the part of the workers themselves. And questions of socialising and networking, because these often are seen as highly social forms of work, but also isolation which is how lots of freelancers tend to experience their work. So people talked about constantly living on the edge, constantly feeling that failure 
was on the near horizon. Others talked about entering that state of panic. And the, 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 that, that's all one quote. The second bit is them quoting the previous inner state. I'm never going to work again, and it's impossible to earn a living, and I should go and get a proper job, really. Working at a bank or something. So a kind of masochistic attitude towards creative labour, where this is not real. I'm, I'm lucky. But is it lucky? I've never got used to the fact that I don't have work. work. I don't think you get used to not earning a wage. What, what, what that person, what she means is, in the periods where there isn't work, it's, it's help. One of the worries is always that I'm not going to work again. But even working in salaried positions, these are actually all quotes from freelancers, I admit, but we found evidence even amongst the workers in salary positions that we interviewed, um, of really high levels of anxiety and insecurity. But again, I want to stress ambivalence, because although that was true, this would be a typical quotation. I don't have any pension, I don't have many holidays, but then it's kind of okay, though, because I've got a great job. I would like, obviously, to have some more time off and to spend some more time with my children. But I think it's infinitely better than spending 12 months a year in a job than I, that I hated. What I would like to suggest these um, experiences and attitudes raise is the possibility that that autonomy and freedom that's particularly prevalent in creative labour compared with other kinds of jobs might act as a kind of control mechanism which encourages workers to accept those problematic conditions or at least provide some sort of compensatory mechanism for it. That's certainly a view taken by the post-structuralist management studies literature in relation to other kinds of pleasure in work than autonomy in other sectors of labour. And it's been applied very interestingly, I think, by a guy called Matt Stahl uh, in a UCSD thesis on musical labour. Uh, I want to come back briefly at the end, I know my time's limited now, but I want to come back briefly at the end to discuss some of the problems with that view. Okay, the third component of the four that I'm going to discuss as the main components of our study is the ethnographic study of the talent show. A bit more briefly here. What I've been trying to show in that, that second part I've just talked to is against the claims of creative industries policy makers, the self-realisation offered by creative labour is actually quite complex. In this piece that we've done on the talent show, we pick up on the work of, uh, of that school of Marxists called the Autonomists, people like Maurizio Lanterato and Horton Negri in the book Empire, where there's an emphasis on the precariousness and insecurity of much modern work. But these writers find in what they see as increasingly prevalent forms of labour, such as they call them immaterial labour and affective labour, and they mention the entertainment industries as key examples of this kind of work, they see high levels of cooperation and of a kind of affective emotional orientation towards others, a kind of communication orientation. And for Hart and Negri, um, another autonomous Marxist, this involves a kind of... Oh, God. Sorry, that's mine. I didn't think it worked in America. <laughs> Please ignore me. Um, this leads to them to a set of almost utopian possibilities for collective action, for revolution. Um, in brief, we're extremely sceptical about this. We use media theory, organisational theory, the kind I've been discussing. Um, we try to look at the subjectivity of some of the workers on these, this talent show to show that the, the, power to, the power that talent shows have to really make somebody's career or not 
leads to, uh, added into the disputes that take place between commissioners who are the central power force in European television now and the independent producers that feed the broadcasters about how best to exercise that power are actually registered down the hierarchical chain in the form of stress, anxiety, and actual conflict between these project teams of young television researchers. There's lots of pleasure, lots of fun in this kind of work. It nearly always takes place within London. Um, it involves partying uh, after a day's work. Um, but there are huge tensions too because it's a six week contract the next three jobs depend on the contacts you're making you're reliant on each other but you're also in competition with each other finally the last main element of, of our study is focusing on how producers creative workers themselves talk about what's good work and what's bad work. We were interested in hearing what they thought, you know, what's a good television program for you? When has it felt good to make a TV show? When do you feel satisfied when you've produced an article for a magazine? Here we seek to build on the work of Georgina Bowen, you know, big and brilliant ethnography of the BBC where she talks about the positive possibilities of cultural production. The need to examine when its powers might be used responsibly, creative, inventively, in given conditions, and when not. She provides an analysis of the situated ethics and aesthetics of the workers she interviews. And she focuses on how the, the reflexivity and agency of these workers conditions the creativity possible in a given medium or genre. What we did, though, was to pursue this through a rather detailed examination of the language that people used in interviews. Um, what we detected there was a, a set of dramatisations, really, of the kinds of conflicts between creativity and commerce that I was discussing earlier, often using the trope of personification in order to convey that and to crystallise interview subjects' own thinking. About, about those things. So I want to give you um, a chunk of interview talk now from a freelance film editor um, that is just intended to briefly give a flavour of, of our approach in this piece. So he says that he was working on a, a factual show, you know, what I was saying earlier, documentary in reality TV for. Uh, and he worked on documentaries for years before. It was about a fireman that wanted to change his life. There were tears in it, there was an argument, and so clearly there was a story about human beings. He needed to change his diet, the young kids wouldn't have it, she, he means the fire fireman's partner, wasn't going along with it, there were arguments. It was a snapshot of what I know is happening. It was great. So it's a, a documentary about a guy losing weight. But then, oh no, we've got this expert saying. And then it became a different film. And then, of course, we hadn't got the material to do that. So then you get that material, you try and force it into, right, expert says, hello, Russell, good morning. And they have all these sorts of clinics where he goes. And those moments sort of work and they motivate him to change. No, there must be day two, and they haven't shot those things. So go away and shoot them. Let me try and explain what's going on here. So it begins with this conception that he feels works, but then Sky TV, with the channel who are making it, decide that they want to make it into a kind of format. And so they decide that they need to introduce a character who is an expert on weight loss which is, oh no, we've got this expert saying. They do so on commercial grounds. Um, again here, I will italicise it because this is where he, he personifies commerce. Right, this is like a director. Right, expert says, hello Russell, good morning. 
Yeah, Russell's the fireman, he comes in. They must be day two, so it's got to be formatted. Day one, Russell is very fat. <laughs> day two, expert comes in and says, right, you can't eat fries anymore or whatever. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so you know, these are the consequences according to this editor. And then the director was sacked, and then they brought this woman in who was the Red Adair of something or other. You know, Red Adair, he was the kind of great oil fighter. Firefighter. Um, so it's kind of a self important hero coming in. I will rescue this television program, according to this guy's attitude. She had so many series out, and she came in. Right, we need the template. Who's got the template? And then the next bit is him enacting the response of the team. Well, what do you want to do? And then her response. Go and shoot some more material. So this imposition of this commercially driven format on what he felt was a good idea means that they have to go and film stuff that then gets edited in as if the weight loss that he achieved was actually a produce of the expert coming in. Basically what they then did, this fellow had lost two or three stone in five or six weeks, and then this bit's in italics because that's him dramatising what the team say. You can't turn the plot, the plot back, you can't go to day one, because this fellow looks much fitter. So how do you film him getting the expert's advice when he's three stone lighter than he was at the beginning? Yeah? They basically did. Okay. They did do that. They made them do that. They said, you've got to go back to day one, and we've got to get to the doctor going in and opening his fridge up and trashing all the food. Right? There's, more, there's more of that that I won't go into. But do you see, what we're trying to get at here is, actually, this is ethical talk. This is a way in which this guy is not only explaining to us as the interviewers, but also, I think, to himself, what is right and wrong about these situations in which commercially driven imperatives are grafted on to something that may well have worked extremely well as a documentary in any case. So it's a dramatisation of ethical dilemmas about truthfulness and integrity and of aesthetic dilemmas, dilemmas regarding different varieties of realism. I just want to make some very brief concluding comments, if I may. This stuff is important, I believe, because aspirations to freedom, to truth, to beauty, remain present in creative labour, unevenly and problematic. They're always under siege in some way, but they remain there. The challenge is how to put that together in some kind of integrated theory of creative labour. Three or four months ago, when I arranged to come out, of course, I thought, Yes, I may have that theory ready. <laughs> <laughs> well, these things take time. That, that's the, if you ever have or a, back, sec, a second trip. <laughs> <laughs> but I think we need something between that kind of utopian idea, both in creative industries policy and in autonomous Marxism, actually. And on the other hand, that post-structuralist effacement of normativity and agency that I was talking about. We need a theory of creative labour that combines social process and questions of intersubjectivity, but in conjunctural terms. And the most promising sources I've found so far are Axel Homer's work on recognition, but also Mark Banks's use of the philosopher Alistair McIntyre and the sociologist Russell Key, where he talks about practices, these enduring forms of um, activity that have their own reward, that aren't about money, wealth and fame. And that and can include anything from chess to fishing to cycling to basket weaving. But Mark Banks, in his really excellent book, The Politics of Cultural Work, draws that out in relation to media labour, cultural labour promising beginning. 
And I think we need a conception that emphasises this very ambivalent process of self-realisation that's intermittently available in the creative industries and the very circumscribed agency that's available to people there. Thank you very much. autonomy and and the kind of one of the threats that you pointed out was the increasing role of marketing right and you said that the marketers you know have you know this kind of obvious different interest right than the creative labor um, and I was just wondering um, in, in in the contemporary economy cultural economy where especially I, I don't know the UK context as well as the US but especially when you have this kind of creative class that has emerged, that has emerged, that I think gets to that amateur versus professional division that you had talked about, versus creative laborers. Can you can you argue? Because I know they argue that marketers and branders are in fact creative laborers. Yeah, yeah, that's a great question. Um, they they are they're, they're cultural workers. They are a part of a complex division of labor that lies behind. Um, media and other cultural goods coming to us. Uh, I don't want to deny that for a minute. Um, but yeah, it's a question of terminology really. There are um, there are people who I, in my book on the cultural industries, talk about as, as primary simple creators. Um, you know, to, to keep the answer concise, it's if, if you cannot, if one cannot appreciate the difference between a musician, writer, director, actor, on the other hand, and someone who is involved in the dissemination of that work, I think you lose a vital analytical distinction. The problem is the excessive romanticization of right. that category of primary symbol creators. I, ho I hope it's clear that you know, we're trying, we're trying to avoid that romantic discourse while holding on to the value of that kind of activity in society. Great. I was wondering if, uh, you're, if you think your analysis applies to uh, the university. Uh, yes. <laughs> and if it does or doesn't, uh, what would be the differences between uh, applying your, your, your model and your framework to the university and applying it to the creative industries? Yeah. Yeah, um, I, I, absolutely, but th there are <coughs> key differences uh, between what you might call uh, higher education labour and, and creative labour. Um, I think, um, and of course as, I think you call it adjunct labour, or, or something like that in, in the States, don't use that term, adjunct. Um, but if you like, part-time work surrounding universities is changing the dynamic that universities are still predominantly based around large organizations that offer uh, relatively steady and secure employment, at least, in, at least in Europe this is the case. That's not to downplay in any way the problems associated with that. That creates a different dynamic from industries where actually the, the majority of labor is part-time, short-term contract, uh, insecure, uh, etc. Um, in, in Europe, there's much better union protection in um, higher education than in, um, in the cultural industries. Um, again, to keep the answer brief, uh, one person who's written about this very helpfully and stimulatingly is Andrew Ross in the, the piece I was quoting. That's a piece called The Mental Labour Problem from social text in the year 2000. And uh, it's actually directly about comparing uh, academic labor with creative labor. He compares university professors with jazz musicians. Um, and he, he explores that more. It's an early piece where he was getting the debate going, really. 
seminal piece, but uh, very interesting in terms of the issues you've rightly raised there. There's a couple of people. Oh, oh, sorry, I think the yeah. person behind you. Uh, two questions. Um, yeah. One is, uh, doesn't focusing on what you're calling the primary symbol creators undercut the possibility of doing the integrated theory of creative labor in the increased sort of division of labor of cultural production? I'm thinking of like Sussman and Lent on, um, I don't know, animation sweatshops um, with you know, a room full of people just doing cell coloring blue or that kind of thing. Yeah. Um, and then the second question is about um, that, the, the cultural policy in the creative class and the role in um, reconstructing urban space. So I forget if it was uh, Bloomberg or Giuliani who said, you know, artists are my shop troops for gentrification. Like, you know, we'll send them in to the neighborhood and they'll create coffee shops and galleries and then we can, uh, you know, go in and kick out people of color who live there and redevelop it and blah, blah, blah. So how do those two pieces? I'm not sure they said exactly. They said the one at the closed door. I think Giuliani might be Great questions, and I always struggle when there's two because I always <laughs> remember the second one. Let me just take the second one first. Um, it, it, absolutely, the creative labour is bound up in those uh, processes of, 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 of gentrification, and there's a whole debate about Richard Florida's work, which you invoke you, 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 the, the use of the term creative class, which is deep, deeply problematic work because it's, you know. In, implicitly pro, pro gentrification uh, um, but we're not really engaged with those debates here just just one of those lines we've, we've drawn around it but, uh, but, it, but it's, it's another reason why creative labor is so important one of the things that Florida does in that book the rise of the creative class is to uh, for, for me very very problematically abolish all distinctions between really different forms uh, of labor. So engineers are treated, you know, lumped in with um, musicians and architects and whatever. I'm not denying that there are links, of course, between those different forms of labor. I mean, there are links between all forms of work as work, as ways of working on the world, fashioning the world, but you have to keep those distinctions, I think, for me. Um, which takes me to that first question, which is a great one. Um, yes, um, I, I, th I think perhaps what you um, invoking is the importance of looking at below the line technical workers and not ignoring the absolutely vital and often unrecognised contribution. And we did interview a lot of people who would be called technical workers uh, problematically from that um, in order to uh, include them in, but um, yeah, there are some differences there too. There, there, there is a division of labour between the creatives and the, and the technicians that need to be a hierarchy. If you look at it right, sorry, you you got one. How much does um, your assessment of normativity play in this whole discussion, in terms of you know? I know, you kind of alluded, you nodded to it when you talked about the interests of marketers versus, which is about mainstreaming and wide distribution versus creative autonomy, which may not initiate from that place. Um, do you go, do you explore that? And what kind of theory are you working on with that? Um, the, the way, my use of the term normativity here is intended to counter a tendency um, in Foucauldian work, which has been very influential in this uh, terrain, uh, of what, towards what Nancy Fraser calls crypto normativity, where a, a whole set of values are buried beneath a kind of tone, um, a, a, a pseudo objective language, really. So, what I want to try to do, building on critical realist social theory that emphasizes the importance <coughs> of a kind of honest clarity about one's normative foundations, as much as one can be, um, is to try and um, 
consider the ways in which we might have arguments about what constitutes good work, how much does this stuff, the kind of television work, magazine work that we've been looking at, actually represent any kind of model for you know, a good society, a society that is, that's based less on the kind of gross inequality and restrictions on freedom that we see increasingly over the last 25 to 30 years at least. So that, that's, that's how I'm using normativity there. Perhaps I'll leave it at that, just to clarify that. Okay. okay. Yes? Well, this will be, oh. uh, I guess, our, be our last talk on the question. I would like you to examine the people who made Grand Theft Auto, <laughs> which they obviously do purely for commercial. They have to sell those products. Do they think that they're creative people? Do they wish they were working for Pixar instead of making, do, are they being forced to say, make this more disgusting? <laughs> <laughs> I think it's a great case study. I, I agree with you. Uh, and I don't study games, and I wish I did. It's possible to can't play it. But it seems to me, having experienced that over the shoulder of somebody in the world, that there's actually a tremendous amount of, of uh, quite high quality creative labour in there, and that'd be astounding if the people involved in, you know, the, the in actually many aspects of the production of that game, but perhaps above all the, um, you know. <coughs> the design of the kinetic and aesthetic experience that's at the core of it, didn't think of themselves as creative. <coughs> I think your question, your point about Pixar though, is a really interesting one, which is one of the ways in which people hierarchize what's good and bad work is to associate it with brands or organizations. And um, you know, I think that can often be quite revealing. <coughs> which are the great companies to work for? And uh, it's nearly always somebody else's company in our, in our ex experience. That's another link with universities, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, we've had a number of really, really interesting presentations uh, throughout the semester, including the one put by David today. And with no disrespect to David, we have, as we often do, saved our best for last, <laughs> which is our own Sarah Benet Weiser next week. Couldn't get anyone else. <laughs> oh, that's not true. That's not true. And in fact, you can just tell them what the title is if you want. Uh, is what right is there. the title? <laughs> the title is Commodity Activism, Marketing, Gender, and the Making of Brand Culture. And it's kind of a historical look at brand culture that actually touches on a lot of the things that David has touched on today. So be here next week for our final Annenberg Research Seminar of the Year. And uh, let's thank David for a really <laughs>